Hello, everyone. Welcome to Oral Advocacy 101. Uh, my name is Carlos from Change Lawyers. I see quite a few familiar names in the comments. Uh, so for those of you who are just joining us, we're going to give folks um, maybe like a minute or so to, to join us. But in the meantime, drop in your name and where you're joining from. I know we have folks from all over the country joining from both the Change Lawyers and the John Paul Stevens uh, communities. And I wanna introduce uh, Anjuli from the John Paul Stevens Foundation uh, to, to greet you all. Hi everyone, my name is Anjuli and uh, I am excited to be here um, for the second portion of our series. And uh, it's so great to see you all joining. Um, and I'm the program director at the John Paul Stevens Foundation. Uh, and uh, we hope that you you find this um, informative and we're also want to queue up that we have one more training in the series coming up, which Carlos will tell you all about at the end of this session. Yeah. Um, and, and you can find um, in the description uh, right below, you can find that uh, more information about that. Uh, welcome, Jasjeet, Valerie, Sandra, Lizette. Lots of folks joining us today for uh, Oral Advocacy 101. Uh, we're honored and proud to be doing this with the John Paul Stevens Foundation. Um, and we're gonna introduce our instructor who, if you were here last week, um, will be familiar to you. Hi, Tiffany, welcome. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here again. Thank you for having me back. And if you all have any questions for Tiffany um, as she's presenting, feel free to drop the questions um, in the chat. And then um, we're gonna save some time at the end to answer them. Um, so just be thinking about them and be ready for, with your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tiffany. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Carlos. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, if you were with us last week, then um, thank you for joining us again. And if this is your first time joining us, then welcome for the first time. Um, it's, it's lovely to be back with you all um, to discuss tips and tricks for effective oral advocacy. Um, so something we talked about last week was that legal writing often doesn't really get emphasized in law school because there are so many substantive courses that need to be covered in order to prepare us for the various bar exams that we take. Um, and unfortunately, oral advocacy gets even less emphasis than legal writing, even though it is arguably uh, just as important to um, competent legal representation. So hopefully this brief one hour session will kind of begin your journey towards improving your um, oral advocacy skills. So, um, you know, just, just a brief reminder, oral advocacy isn't something that just happens in the formal setting of a courtroom, although that's certainly one place where it's, where it's very important. Um, it really happens in sort of our day-to-day -day li uh, day -day lives as lawyers, uh, you know, whether you're a judicial intern who needs to report on your case law and research findings to a judge, uh, or if you're an associate at a law firm and you need to discuss important client matters with the partner overseeing the case, um, or if you're involved in sort of a mediation or a settlement negotiation, um, all of those settings require the ability to communicate effectively through oral advocacy. Uh, so, you know, just, just an important reminder that, that don't only think about oral advocacy in the context of a courtroom. It really happens sort of all around us every day. So with that in mind, let's dive into today's presentation. And I just want to begin by talking about the purposes and goals of oral argument, uh, because keeping these in mind, I think, will help you as you both prepare for argument and when you're actually delivering an argument. So turning first to some of the purposes of oral argument. Uh, essentially, oral argument is an opportunity for you as the attorney to have a dialogue with the judge or panel of justices who will be deciding your issue. Um, and really, it's an opportunity to breathe life into the written discussions that are contained in either your motion or your brief. Um, and I'm, I'm using the word motion because you know so I, I recognize some of you may be trial attorneys, some of you may be appellate attorneys, um, but, but in both contexts, sort of oral argument serves the same purpose, which is to breathe life into your written discussions. 
Um, and I really want to emphasize that oral argument is meant to be a dialogue not a speech. Uh, so, you know, it's it really, you want to think of it always as a conversation between you and the bench, not a one-way speech um, that I think some people maybe who are unfamiliar with the practice of oral advocacy sort of have in mind when they hear the word oral advocacy. So it is not a speech, it is a conversation. <laughs> um, in addition, uh, oral argument is, well, actually, so uh, briefly, what oral argument is not is it is not a substitute for any gaps that may have been left by the written briefs. So, you know, there's sort of this notion in the law that the written briefs are sort are, are where the arguments are won and lost. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, to that belief. Um, and but that doesn't mean that oral argument doesn't still serve an important purpose. Um, and really the, what it does is it gives you an opportunity to highlight emphasize or simplify some of the most important points that are in your written briefs. So, um, you know, a lot of times with briefing, you have to include every single point you want to make because there's the risk that if you don't include it, you waive the issue. Um, and again, that applies in both the trial court and the court of appeal. Um, but oral argument gives you a chance to sort of get away from that rigid rigidity um, and instead just focus on the most salient points that you want to discuss with the court because you think the court will be the most interested in them. Um, so that's another purpose of oral argument. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the goals. What are we trying to achieve when we set out to present an oral argument to a court? So the first, um, the, in, in, in my mind, the, the first primary goal of an oral argument is to identify and address the court's concerns. So think about the way a, a court, uh, excuse me, think about the way a matter gets to oral argument. First, there's some sort of opening brief or, an op or, or a motion made. Then there's an opposition that's filed or a respondent's brief. And then there's a reply that's done. And then there's a little bit of lag time, typically. Sometimes it's only like a week or two. Sometimes it's, you know, eight months, depending on the, the setting that you're in. Um, but regardless, those written documents are one way conversation or excuse me, one way um, communications that focus on what the attorneys think are the most important points to be made about the case. But there's no opportunity from the court's perspective to sort of identify what it believes are the most important points or areas of concern. So that's where oral argument comes in. It's really the chance for the court to identify for the parties what it believes are the most salient points that need to be discussed. So um, it really is, um, I keep using the word opportunity, it really is just that. It's an opportunity for counsel to hear from the court, um, hear what the court is most concerned about and, and address those concerns head on um, in a way that maybe it, the, the parties just didn't have the chance to do in the briefing. Um, it's also an opportunity sort of relatedly to identifying and addressing the court's concerns. It's also an opportunity to answer any questions that the court may have. So again, when you're writing a brief, you have no idea what's in the mind of the judge or judges who will be deciding these issues. So oral argument gives you that chance to sort of hear from them for the first time, listen to their questions um, and respond directly to them, kind of removing that one way element that exists in the briefing. Um, in addition, oral argument is a chance to focus on so-called decisive points. So again, think about how, how you might structure a written brief. Let's say, for example, you're raising an issue about evidence that, that shouldn't be admitted. Um, and there's really not a strong dispute that the evidence is inadmissible. So really the question comes down to, was it pre would it be prejudicial if it were admitted? And I guess I'm more speaking from the perspective of an appeal where the evidence did come in when it shouldn't have. And the question is how might it have impacted the, the result of the case? So in that situation, the prejudice is sort of the most important point that you wanna discuss, but because of the way we're supposed to structure briefs, the prejudice would be the last thing that you talk about in the written presentation of the issue. But at oral argument, you get to kind of break free from the shackles of that structure and you can just dive right into the most important point, which is prejudice. Um, so again, this is sort of an illustration of how um, oral argument is an opportunity to 
really just focus on the decisive points rather than be stuck with the structure um, of your brief. And then in addition, oral argument is a chance to give the court sort of a broader perspective on the case. So first of all, just by virtue of you being in court to talk about the case reminds the court that there is in fact a human dimension to the case. It's not just a paper dispute. There are real people involved with a real dispute going on. And there are high stakes, you know, whether it's someone's liberty that's at stake or they have a significant financial interest that's at stake or they suffered, you know, really horrific personal injuries. All of these are things that sort of tend to get lost in briefing because we have to spend so much of our time focusing on the legal issues and analyzing the legal issues. Um, but, the, but the facts are important and reminding the court of the human dimension can, can really sort of help ground the court's decision ultimately. So, it's, so oral argument is a great opportunity for that as well. Um, and on a similar note, in addition to sort of highlighting some of the important facts from your case, oral argument is a chance to talk about broader public policy um, factors that may militate in, in your client's favor. And sometimes those public policy arguments are hard to weave into a brief, either because they don't fit into the structure um, or because they just sort of feel like a sidetrack to the main issues. Uh, but regardless, it's because it can be difficult to highlight them in a brief, oral argument is really a great chance to bring them back into the, the court's mind and, and remind them you know, how, how, how the court's ruling could influence future decisions and future similar legal issues. Um, and things to that effect. So those are sort of the primary goals of oral argument. Now let's talk about some of the secondary goals of oral argument. Um, one of the secondary goals of oral argument is to clarify um, any potential ambiguities that may exist in the briefs. Now, again, just, just to be clear, oral argument can't undo a bad brief. Brief, writing a good solid brief that includes every point you need to raise is an important first step in the, oral, in the overall advocacy process. But that being said, sometimes when we're writing, you know, we're so involved in the case at the time that we might omit something or um, not, not, a, not, a, not a legal issue necessarily, but like we might fail to make a connection for the court that maybe we should have made. Um, leaving a little bit of ambiguity in, in either the facts of the case or a complicated, um, you know, holding from a different case that's that's relevant to our discussion. And sometimes those ambiguities don't really come to light until after the briefing is complete and you're in the process of preparing for oral argument. So giving your oral argument is a chance to offer clarifications on those potential ambiguities that you might identify after the fact. Um, it's also an opportunity again, and this is more of a secondary goal, but it's an opportunity to augment arguments that you've made in your briefs. So again, you're not going to raise new issues, and that's something we'll discuss on the next slide. Um, but again, sometimes having a little bit of time and distance away from your brief um, gives you a little bit of you know, insight that you didn't have while you were writing the brief. And um, you know, so the best example I can give would be, I, you know, this happens to me all the time, I'll write an opening brief, I'll write a reply brief, and then months will go by, and then, I, and then it comes time for me to prepare for oral argument, and I'll suddenly think of like this really brilliant hypothetical that just perfectly illustrates a point I was trying to make in my, in my briefing. Now, that, I'm not raising a new point by doing that, but the hypothetical can really help kind of bring a point that I did make home for the court. So oral argument is a chance to kind of augment my arguments by presenting that hypothetical, for example. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind as well when you're preparing for oral arguments. And then lastly, this doesn't, this doesn't happen very often, um, but there is an opportunity to um, update the court on any post-briefing developments that may have occurred. Because again, sometimes there's a several month lag between when the briefing is complete and when the oral argument takes place. Um, so this can kind of come up in two different ways that, that I can think of. The first one is new relevant legal authority comes out that's um, directly on point or, or at least kind of tangentially related to one of the issues that, that's been raised in the briefing. 
Now, ideally, you should have a system in place where you're sort of keeping up with new developments in the law on your own anyways, whether it's on a, you know, on a daily basis, a weekly basis, hopefully some sort of regular interval, you're kind of checking, checking the advance sheets, just keeping up with the developments of, of law in your state. Um, and when you see a case that comes out that might be relevant to an issue that's involved in one of your cases, um, you should try to bring that to the court's attention as soon as possible. And you should do so in writing. Don't wait till the oral argument to do it. Some courts have very specific rules that address this process. Others don't. Um, when I'm in a court that doesn't have a specific process in place, I usually just kind of cobble together my own pleading. You know, sometimes it's called like a supplemental brief or something like that, but just kind of to make it clear to the court, this isn't a new point. This is just a case that's relevant to a point that's already been briefed. Um, so that's one situation where you might need to um, be ready and able to update the court on a development, um, on a post-briefing development. The other situation I've encountered, although this is way more rare, is um, if there's like a factual development in the case or a procedural development. Um, typically courts won't actually consider those in issuing a ruling. But nevertheless, judges are human and human curiosity may prompt them to ask, you know, what's going on in the case since the reply brief was filed, um, just because they just are, they just want to know, not because it's going to change the outcome of the appeal for them. So as counsel of record, you should definitely kind of know the answer to that and be prepared to, um, to, to offer an answer that, um, that satisfies the court, um, the court's curiosity. So yeah, that kind of, th those are the main goals of oral argument. Um, and just as importantly as, as knowing what oral argument is for, is knowing what oral argument is not for. So the very, the first and most important thing you do not want to use oral argument for is to simply rehash the stuff that's in your briefs. And the reason for this is because the judge or judges who are going to handle the, the issue are going to come to argument pretty prepared. And the level of preparedness may vary from court to court and from judge to judge, but it's safe to assume that at a minimum they will have read the briefs. Um, they might even have already issued a tentative opinion that you or a tentative ruling that you have in your possession. Um, if it's a panel of judges who are deciding the issue, they may have had a conference among themselves already to talk about the issues. Um, so because there's a certain level of preparedness that already goes into just holding a hearing where there's an oral argument um, taking place, you, you definitely would just be wasting your and the court's time if you just rehash what's in your briefs already. So um, instead, you want to sort of proceed from the assumption that the judges have put in the level of work um, that I just discussed and, and, and sort of proceed from there. But you still also want to be flexible because judges are really busy people and sometimes the level of preparedness that they have isn't as high as you might have assumed. And so if it, if it becomes apparent by, through the argument and through the questions you're getting that maybe the judge doesn't know the case as well as you thought they did, then you can take a step back and say, you know, let, let me give the, the court a, a, a really brief overview of the factual background, just so that we're all in, uh, on the same footing when it comes to the legal issues um, or something like that. So you do have to be a little bit um, flexible in that regard. Um, but again, you should, you should sort of assume that some level of preparedness has gone into, into the hearing um, and, and definitely avoid rehashing your briefs. That's just not going to be a good use of your time. And, and the court is going to look very disfavorably upon that. Um, in addition, as I mentioned on the last slide, oral argument is not an opportunity to raise new issues. Um, and really, it's just our judicial system is not a system of sandbagging, we don't really get su to surprise our opponents. That's just not how our system has, has come to, to work. So um, anytime that the court perceives that sandbagging is occurring, they're going to look very disfavorably upon that as well. Um, if you, as I, as I mentioned, if you do um, you know, see like a new relevant case that's come out, you should alert the court to that fact as soon as possible. That wouldn't be considered raising a new issue. That would just be considered sort of keeping the court apprised of relevant legal developments. Um, 
on an, on an existing issue. But that being said, sometimes through the process of oral argument, the parties on the court will sort of stumble upon an issue that hadn't thoroughly been briefed or maybe hadn't been briefed at all, let alone thoroughly. Um, and when that happens, uh, there, there might be, you know, an opportunity for you to ask the court if you could present a supplemental brief on the issue, if it becomes apparent that this is, you know, not only an important issue to the court, but potentially dispositive to the, to the outcome of the case. Um, you certainly don't want to miss a chance to to brief the issue in writing in addition to having that oral oral discussion with the court about it. Um, so again, even though oral argument is not meant to raise new issues, sometimes the new issues sort of get raised organically through the oral argument process. And so when that happens, just be on the lookout for it and be prepared to ask for permission to submit a supplemental brief. And then finally, it is entirely normal during an oral argument for certain concessions to be made, um, but you do not want to use oral argument as, an op as a chance to, to officially abandon a claim. If you are going to abandon a claim, first of all, it's something you should have discussed with the team of attorneys that you're working with, as well as potentially your client, depending on what the sort of context is. Um, so it should be very well discussed ahead of time. But also, secondly, it should be done in writing prior to the oral argument. Um, and really, it's because it sort of has an element of surprise to it if you do it at oral argument. Um, and it could also come off as kind of um, there's a chance for sort of messiness if it's done orally as opposed to in writing. Um, so, so the better course of action is just, you know, if, if, if you're even thinking about abandoning a claim, making sure you do so ahead of time in writing and in consultation with everyone that needs to be consulted about it first. And let's see, I just want to check because it looks like we got a question. Let's see, Carlos, I don't know, do you see that question from Lori? Would we be able to post that uh, for the whole for the whole crew to see? Yes, let Great. me Thank you. put it up right now. Great, thank you. So the question is, would you use a past case presented in from the, uh, from the same judge as a ref for an argument in your new case? Um, so I just wanna make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, if we're talking about a situation where I'm presenting an oral argument to a judge that has already issued a ruling in a different case um, that, I, that I either worked on or I'm familiar with, I certainly, I, I, and if that, to the extent that is the question, um, I certainly do like to do that. Um, you know, when you can find prior decisions issued by the judge that you are arguing to, it definitely, I think, benefits you to reference those cases um, in front of that judge. Um, one, because it's a little bit of like an ego stroke. It makes the judge, it, it conveys to the judge that you, you know, not only are prepared, but that you believe in the court's reasoning. Um, and find, find persuasive the court's reasoning. Uh, but also, two, I think, I think it's just human nature to sort of be persuaded by our own, our own words and our own thoughts. Um, so it's sort of just, if you, if you know of a prior decision issued by the judge that you're arguing to, um, I, I do think there's benefit to, to doing what you can to cite to that case. Um, so if you're in federal district court and, and you're in front of a particular judge and you're doing legal research, and again, this goes all the way back to the writing process. As you're doing the writing, you really should be trying to cite decisions issued by that particular judge. By the same token, if you're in the court of appeal, you know, it's helpful. Well, the court of appeal is a little more complicated because sometimes you don't know who the judges will be until closer to the hearing date. Um, but regardless, you certainly want to be citing cases from the court itself, even if you don't know the, the specific judges who will be on your panel. It's, it's definitely beneficial to reference decisions by the particular court that you're in front of. And you can say, as this court held or, you know, as this court found, um, just to you know remind the court, like, I'm not asking you to do anything new here. This is something you've already done before. Um, so there's definitely some persuasive value in that, both in writing and at oral argument. Uh, thank you for that question. Okay, so now that we've talked about the sort of purposes and goals of oral argument, let's talk about how to prepare for an oral argument. Um, and uh, really it comes down to 
these sort of nine basic steps and how much time you spend on each of these steps is definitely going to vary from case to case based on how complex it may be. Um, but it will also vary based on how much time you have to prepare. Um, you know, so, like I said, sometimes you know months in advance when the argument's coming. Sometimes you have maybe like 10 days to prepare. So it really like you have to be flexible and kind of be, be quick to adjust your, um, your time budgeting as you prepare for an argument, depending on how much time you're given. Um, so just we'll go through these steps pretty quickly. Um, and this, the, I, I typically follow these, I'll, I'll highlight where I deviate from this um, a, a, in a few areas, but for the most part, the very first thing I do is I reacquaint myself with the issues by either by rereading all the briefs. And um, this typically doesn't take very long because usually I've written at least half of the documents I'm reading. So it's, it's more of a reminder than anything else. Um, but, but still, it's worth it to take that time to read, not skim, but actually read the briefs that were written and just, just to kind of get the juices flowing to start thinking about how am I going to turn this into an oral argument. <clears throat> um, also, doing, in doing so, um, it helps to um, identify areas in the record that you may need to go back to to re-familiarize yourself with. It's not enough to just know what's in the briefs you know, oftentimes the oral argument will will revolve around what are the facts in the record. So using the briefs as a springboard to like identify which pages in the record you need to go back and look at is also a very good use of time. Um, because the last thing you want to do is tell a court, oh, I don't know, it's in the record, but I don't know where. That's, you don't want to be answering questions like that. So um, using the time to um, re-familiarize yourself with not only what's in the written motion or the briefs, but also in the record itself. Very good use of time. Um, next, you'll want to update your research. And again, where I deviate from this is I tend to sort of update my research just naturally through the process of staying up to date on what the legal developments are in my state. Um, so I'm rarely in a situation where I, sh I shepherdize a case that I cited in a brief and suddenly there's some new case out there that I didn't know about. Typically, if the case, if a case has come out that's relevant to my issue, I know about it within a week of when the case has been, has been decided. So updating your research is, is something you can do just sort of post briefing on a regular basis. It's not something you need to save until you're actually preparing for the oral argument. Um, but that being said, if, if you are in that situation, Regardless, it is important to update your research because the last thing you want to do is cite outdated cases at oral argument. Um, and, and, and by the way, this includes adverse cases, obviously, you know, to the extent a new case may have come out that's really bad for the argument that you've made, um, you, you can't shy away from that. You know, just like, just like when you're writing a brief, you have to be willing and able to confront those negative authorities, um, either by distinguishing them or, um, or arguing that they were wrongly decided, assuming they were issued by a court that is not binding to your court. Um, so having a plan though, for how to deal with that adverse authority, having that plan up front before you go to argument is definitely a good idea. So that's another reason why it's important to update your research. And then once you're re-familiar, um, familiarized with the case and you have updated legal research, um, this is where um, you really have to start thinking about, well, I have limited time for oral arguments, so I better limit my discussion to sort of the most, the topics that I think are the most important. Um, and, and when I say the ones that you think are the most important, really what I mean is the ones that you think the court will think are most important. Um, because again, oral argument isn't about you necessarily. It's about you identifying what the court is co most concerned about and then addressing those concerns and those questions head on. So it's a little bit of like you're trying to read a crystal ball and think to yourself, like, what are these justices going to care about the most? Um, and that takes time and practice. Believe me, it's not something everyone's going to get right right off the bat. Um, but, but as long as you are, you know, planning to just focus on a few issues and not just throw in the whole you know, everything that you covered in your brief, that means you're already on the right track. Then it just comes, it comes down to fine tuning those selections so that you're really spotting like what is the court most interested in. 
Um, so after you've selected the topics that you want to focus on at argument, then you'll want to create an effective um, outline that you can reference during your argument um, to the extent you're kind of given time to talk freely without being interrupted by the court, uh, which we'll discuss uh, a little bit later. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so you're you want to organize those topics in some sort of logical, you know, some way that's logical to you, whether it's you know, um, level of importance or um, chronological. Um, again, every case is going to be different. Um, but but regardless, having sort of a an outline to help guide your conversation will be very helpful to both you and the court when you're presenting your your argument. And I emphasize outline, not prepared speech, because as I said very early on in this presentation, an oral argument is not a speech. Um, so it may be helpful to you as you prepare to kind of write out word for word what you hope to say. But at the end of the day, really what you want to go into court with is really just the bare bones outline that gives you a little bit of flexibility to improvise. Um, because people who, you know, when you have to sit there listening to a prepared speech, it can get a little bit boring. And the last thing you want is for your panel of judges or your judge to kind of tune you out after just a few minutes. So try to avoid, you know, reading a speech and instead just work off of an outline. And then sort of on a related note, you, um, as you prepare to discuss the points in your outline, um, also be prepared to not do it necessarily in the order you've selected. So even though it's important to be organized, there's, you know, always the very real possibility that the court's going to kind of drag you all over your outline. And so having modular discussions prepared ahead of time will help you find your footing in your own argument as you're being dragged throughout your outline. Um, so, you know, even though you may have an idea for the order in which you want to discuss things, being flexible and being able to think on your toes as the court kind of decides, nope, you wanted to talk about point number three, you know, later, but we're going to talk about it first, you know, being able to adapt to that situation quickly and effectively is, is going to make you a very, very strong role advocate. And then while you're sort of preparing these discussions, you want to kind of have, I have an idea in your mind about how much time you hope to spend talking about each of these issues. Um, you know, if there's one issue that you, that you think the court is going to think is really important, Maybe you can plan on budgeting a little bit more time for it and, you know, being willing to sort of let go of the other points in case you don't get to them. Um, but just, you know, always one, know how much time you're going to be given for argument to the extent the court tells you ahead of time. And then just have a ballpark in mind of how much time you hope to spend on each of your points. But again, because the court's questions might take you off, off of your, you know, planned discussions, you might have to be flexible even in, in how you budget that time as well. But it helps to have in mind, like, you know, here's, I, I think about a third of my argument time should be spent on this one issue. Um, just having something like that in mind will help, help you kind of get through your argument um, more cleanly. Um, in addition, you want to think about what are the materials you want to bring into the courtroom with you um, and organize and prepare those materials in a way that they will be most useful to you. Um, you know, as an attorney, the last thing you want to do is show up with like this big pile of disorganized papers and then you get a question from the bench and you're kind of like sh shuffling through hundreds of pages looking for an answer. Um, that level of disorganization is, is not going to come off as polished or professional. It's going to make you seem really unprepared, even if you know the case really, really well. Um, so, you know, first of all, try to be thoroughly familiar with the record without having to have any papers. But, um, but in addition, to the extent you, you do bring papers with you to the podium, make sure that they're organized in a way, you know, with tabs or like an index or so, whatever system you use to help you quickly find information in an organized and efficient manner. Um, so that you're not, because again, oral argument, you have very limited time. So you don't want to waste that time searching through, you know, lots of documents. You want to just be able to give the court an answer to its question and move on back to your argument. And then, so number eight is probably the thing I devote the most amount of my preparation time to, and that is anticipating the court's questions um, and preparing answers to them. And I think it was um, Chief, Chief Justice Roberts at the US Supreme Court who talked about how this was his 
um, practice when he was um, an appellate attorney is he, you know, in addition to, to doing all the steps we just talked about, he would just sit down with a blank piece of paper and write down every single question that he imagined the court could possibly ask about his case. And then he would practice what his answers would be. Um, and he would specifically focus on the questions that would potentially be the hardest ones for him to answer. Basically like the questions like that you kind of almost hope you don't get because you don't necessarily feel super confident in your answer to them. Those are the ones that you should spend the most time preparing for. Because again, courts are sharp. They, they identify weaknesses in your case, whether you want them to or not. Um, and if they're gonna question you about them, you really would rather be overly prepared for that than underprepared. Um, so I definitely, this is sort of the, the step I recommend spending the most amount of time on um, because it can really just help you achieve sort of a more effective oral argument at the end of the day, because when the court asks you those inevitable questions, you'll have a solid response each time. Um, and in fact, you might even recruit other, if, if you're working on a team of attorneys, you may even recruit some of them to ask you these hard questions so you can practice delivering the answer to someone other than yourself in a mirror. Um, and then lastly, the final step on this slide is to become familiar with court members and local procedures. Um, and this is a really simple step, to be honest. It really just involves doing a little bit of Googling before the argument. Um, hopefully you'll know the name of your judge or justices by then. So you can just look them up, get a sense of you know, who they are, how long have they been on the bench, what did they do before they were judges, um, you know, and, and things like that. When were they appointed? Um, definitely knowing their names so you can address them as you know, justice so-and-so because uh, you always want to be respectful. So, so at least knowing their names can, can go a long way toward that. Um, although it's also perfectly acceptable to just say your honor. Um, so it's okay if you don't, if you can't remember all their names or you're unsure how to pronounce them. Um, and also just getting a sense of how does the courtroom flow? Um, and for this step, really, it's just a matter of just show up early. You know, unless you're the first case on calendar, if you show up early, you can just watch how the court handles other matters. You can get a sense of how does this judge or these panel of or this panel of justices, how do they engage with counsel? Do they ask a lot of questions or do they tend to just sit there quietly and absorb the information? Um, so just having a little bit of that information as you go into your own argument will help sort of alleviate some fears, but also you know, make your argument even more effective because you'll know how to cater it to, to this particular judge or the panel of justices. And lastly, this, so this step is not on the slide, but it, it occurred to me this morning as something that I find myself doing more and more um, as my years of, of practice continue. So I just wanted thought I'd share it with you all. Um, when you're preparing for an oral argument, I find that another effective thing you can do is talk to your friends and family members about your case. Now, obviously there's confidentiality issues involved in that. So what I'm really talking about is if you filed a motion or a brief and it's not filed under seal, then the whatever's written in those documents is technically public record. So that would be fair game. To, you could talk about that information with loved ones. Um, and so often as the you know, days leading up to an argument occur and I'm having um, you know, dinner with my husband or dinner with my parents, none, none of whom are lawyers, um, you know, sometimes I'll just say, hey, can I talk to you about my case for a few minutes just to kind of get in the habit of, of, of you know, using my client's name and the facts of the case and things like that. And you know, because, <laughs> because my family is wonderful, they'll say yes. <laughs> And, um, and, and through those sort of informal conversations, I find that one, my level of familiarity with the case gets a, a big boost because I'm just getting used to talking about it. Um, but also two, it helps me find ways to explain even the most complicated legal arguments in a way that someone that has no legal training is able to understand. And when you get to the point that you can do that effectively, it sort of gives you the confidence to know that when you're talking to the judge who does have some legal training, you will be able to communicate to them effectively whatever points it is that you're trying to make. Um, so again, it's 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 not a you know necessarily like a, a an important formal step in preparing for an argument, but I do find that having informal conversations 
um, with 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 anyone in your life, uh, but but especially people that that don't have legal training, can be a really effective way to improve your um, oral advocacy skills as well. Okay, so on that note, let's talk about delivering the oral argument. So, what are the basic components of a presentation? Well, um, first you have the sort of opening lines. You know, I'm sure you've all seen either, you know, like YouTube videos of this or maybe like um, movie portrayals where usually the attorney will say something like, good morning, your honor or your honors, and may it please the court. My name is so-and-so. I, re I represent the appellant, you know, John Doe. Um, so that's like the, you know, that's considered the salutation. Um, it's definitely a little formal and clunky seeming. And you know, if you're familiar with the court that you're in and you know that the judge or justices don't really care about that, you can just launch into your argument. Um, it's, you know, but again, it's very court specific. Some courts really like that level of formality. So it's sort of up to you to, to know the practice in your area and to follow that practice. Um, but if you are in a situation, well, regardless, um, at some point you will have had to introduce yourself. Typically the court will ask for counsel to state their appearances. Um, so even if you don't do it in the salutation, you will have already told the court your, your, your full name and who you represent and what case, case you're there to discuss. Um, and then the, the third part of the opening line is sort of the brief summary of the points you hope to cover in your argument that day. And to me, that's the most important part. And typically if I'm in a court where I don't have to do the formal may it please the court thing, I usually just dive right into that third, um, that third point where I'm summarizing, like here, you know, today I plan to focus on X, Y, and Z. And then I dive into the first point. Um, so that's the salutation. Then, um, as I mentioned, you would, you would immediately dive into whatever prepared discussion you have. Um, again, hopefully at this point, you're not reading from a script. You're you know, you're using an outline and sort of improvising a little bit on the words. Um, but in my experience, the prepared discussion portion of the oral argument lasts a very short amount of time. <laughs> it's I have I I don't think I've ever gotten more than a minute into an oral argument before being in, before being interrupted with a question. Um, and, and frankly, I, I I like answering questions more than I like presenting a, a you know a prepared discussion, so I welcome the questions. Um, but to the extent you are the type of person who is is uh, more nervous about receiving questions, I would still mentally prepare for the possibility that you won't be given much opportunity to to um, share your prepared the prepared portion of your discussion before being interrupted with a question. Um, so I'm just trying to you know manage expectations and under you know keep 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 it clear that that uh, questions are a natural part of the oral argument process. Um, but regardless, you'll you know you'll you'll be allowed to give your prepared discussion for a little bit of time, and so that will be the the you know sort of second part of the oral argument after you've done your salutation. Um, and and then we'll and then we'll really get to what typically is the meat of oral argument, which is responding to the court's questions. And the next few slides will will deal more specifically with that. But um, but basically, like really quickly, the most important thing when you're responding to questions is you want to respond directly and immediately to the question being asked. You never want to say something like, I'll get there later <laughs> or something to that effect. Um, you, you really want to just, you know, the court is in charge here. So if, if they have a question for you, you just want to answer that question immediately and directly. Um, and it might lead to more questions, or maybe they just have that one question and then you can go back to your prepared discussion. Um, but either way, answer immediately and directly. And also when the court jumps in with a question, if they're interrupting you, you need to stop talking to let them ask that question. That's another important part of responding is letting them ask the question in the first place. And then lastly, um, the the so typically you want to give some sort of conclusion to your argument if you're the one arguing first chances are you'll be given that chance to do a rebuttal which is the last point on the slide um so it's less important necessarily that you wrap up during the primary part of your argument um you could really do the conclusion instead in the rebuttal portion 
Um, but, but sometimes, you know, the argument ends because the court is like in the middle of asking you this intense line of questions. So in that situation, sometimes I feel that trying to shove a brief conclusion in before you sit down almost feels like you're trying to force it on the court. Um, so instead, you could wrap up by saying something simple like, unless the court has any further questions, I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal um, or something like that. Um, but if you have, if you're in a situation where you're not being asked a ton of questions and you do actually have the chance to kind of wrap up in like a nice way, um, then certainly take the opportunity to maybe remind the court, here's the disposition I'm asking for. You know, like we respectfully request that you reverse the judgment or that you affirm the judgment um, or, you know, something like that. Like have like a little one sentence package of, you know, that summarizes what it is you're asking the court to do. Um, but again, don't be flexible. Don't try to force it. If you're in a situation where it just doesn't flow naturally, it's okay to just say, you know, thank you for your time um, and, and sit down. That's completely acceptable as well. And then lastly, as I mentioned, depending on which position you're in, you may have the opportunity for rebuttal. Um, in my experience as an appellate attorney, you know, the appellant argues first, the respondent argues next, and then the appellant has a chance to rebut. And then that's it. It's a very kind of rigid structure. In the trial court, it can be a little bit more fluid. It really depends on the judge. Um, and also who talks first may vary. It might not be the moving party who talks first. It might be whoever requested the hearing. And usually that's the person that lost the tentative opinion or tentative ruling. So again, there's a little bit more flexibility in the trial court. Um, I've definitely had judges that allowed rebuttal and then sir rebuttal and then another rebuttal on top of that. I mean, it was just a very, um, you know, a very lengthy back and forth where the court really let both sides have have their say on every point they wanted to make. Um, but again, that's very judge specific. So it helps. Um, that's another reason why it helps to know sort of the practice in your area. OK, but let's talk specifically about responding to the court's question, because as I mentioned, this is really sort of the most important part of oral argument and probably the part most of us dread the most. So let's talk about some strategies for dealing with it. Um, you know, like I said, it's really hard to predict how judges are going to behave during your argument. Some judges like to just sit there quietly and observe. Um, other justices will virtually take over the argument with lengthy questions. Um, it, so it really just depends on who you're, who you're in front of. Um, but no matter who it is, um, there are some things you want to just do no matter what. And that, as I mentioned, the first thing is respond immediately and directly to the judge's question. Um, and, and this applies even if you think the question is a little off base or maybe addresses a point that you don't think is particularly important. It's the court's opinion that counts here, not yours. So if the court is asking you a question, um, it's because it thinks it's important. Now, so, so, so that's why it's important to address it head on. But at the same time, you are allowed to respectfully explain why you think the point that's being made isn't relevant to the issue that needs to be decided. Um, but only after you've answered the court's question can you politely point that out. So again, just keeping in mind that responding immediately and directly is by far the most important thing that you do as an oral advocate and you should prioritize it every time you're asked a question. Um, and again, you never wanna say something in response like, I'll get to that or something like that. Um, you might get kind of a, 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 an upset panel or an upset judge if you take that approach with them. Um, because the fact is, in their mind, you're, you are already there. So saying, I'll get there later, is not going to be a satisfying answer. Um, and if the court asks, if the court's question is a yes or no question, you know, when I say respond directly to it, I mean, say yes or no right off the bat, just to make it clear what the answer is, and then offer your further explanation afterwards. But that goes along with um, really answering the question directly, saying yes or no, if it's a yes or no question. Um, in addition, once you've started getting questions from the panel, um, you know, and this is tricky to do because you're nervous, you're live in the moment, um, and you're trying to think really quickly on your feet, but because the questions are often a window into the mind of the court in terms of what they're thinking about in your case and what concerns they have, 
um, you really do want to try to take it as an opportunity to tailor your argument to the court's questions. Um, so again, that means, you know, you have this outline in front of you, but being willing to just let it go and just go with what the court's questions and concerns are, um, that will, that will, even though it feels weird, it, it does make you a stronger advocate in the long run because now you're addressing what the court cares about the most and that can only benefit your client at the end of the day. So being not only willing, but also able to tailor your argument to the court's questions and comments is a very effective tool for all advocacy. Um, but again, that being said, sometimes courts miss the point. Maybe, again, maybe it's that lack of preparedness because they just had so, you know, they had so many other matters to deal with before the argument. Either way, if you get the sense that maybe there's, some, there's something being lost in the court's understanding, you are allowed to correct that as well. Um, you don't have to tailor your argument to points that, that are you know, truly either beside the point or irrelevant to your issues. Um, so again, you want to address the court's questions and concerns, but at the same time, if you need to, you're allowed to politely correct the court's understanding to the extent it may be overlooking other important you know, relevant issues. Um, and again, you know, oral argument is an opportunity to clarify ambiguities, um, both in your own brief, but also in the court's understanding of certain, you know, facts or legal issues or the legal authority that they're dealing with. Um, so if you get the sense um, through the questions that there's a, that there's any misunderstanding or ambiguity that needs to be clarified, use your responses to the court's questions as a chance to do so. <clears throat> And lastly, I, I kind of touched on this earlier when I said, don't use oral argument as a chance to abandon claims. Um, you know, I mentioned the idea of like, there's inevitably some, some sometimes where concessions or admissions need to be made. Um, so when you are responding to court's questions, if they're sort of asking you to make a concession, um, just be aware of, of that, of when that happens and, and know that, um, you know, there's a risk that if you make a concession, it could have binding effect on you and your client. Um, so really, it's something that you should be thinking about and practicing ahead of time. Ideally, with the you know, if you're working on a team, do that with the team. Um, but regardless, just be very clear with your with yourself. Here are the points that I can stand to to concede, um, and here are the points that I cannot afford to concede because we'll just lose we'll lose the entire case if that happens. Um, so knowing the boundaries of your own argument and where it's safe to relinquish a little bit of, you know, to admit like, okay, yeah, maybe the court's right on that, but we still win because, you know, knowing what your alternative arguments are, knowing those boundaries, like all of that is very important to your preparation for argument and specifically when you're responding to the court's questions. Um, but again, sometimes, like I said, it's completely unavoidable. Like if you're asked to make a concession, that there's no you know, legally supportable way not to make that concession, then you need to be willing and able to do that. And, and, that, and by the way, that could go a long way toward building your credibility with the court. So concessions are not by any stretch a bad thing, but it's just important to know when and where and what the concession can be um, before you go into argument. Don't try to make that decision like live in the moment when you're you know, in front of the panel and, and um, kind of under that pressure. Okay, so what do you do if you don't know the answer to a question? Um, basically, you admit it. <laughs> There's really no other way to say it. Um, you, it's, it's completely, you know, no, even the most effectively prepared advocate is occasionally gonna get a question that they just don't know the answer to. And that's completely okay. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to, to worry about. Um, because again, all we can do is, is prepare to the best of our ability. Um, and, and even in that situation, we're going to be caught off guard sometimes. Um, so, you know, just don't, don't try to fudge the answer. Um, certainly never misrepresent the law or the facts. Just admit that you don't know the answer. And um, if, you, if you have the ability to do so, request the opportunity to discuss the point in a supplemental letter or brief. Um, because again, credibility is so important with any court, 
Um, and if you get asked a, a question that you don't know the answer to, you're not going to be able to lie or, or fudge the truth your way out of it. Um, so better to just be upfront and honest, and that will go a long way toward, um, toward building your credibility with the court as well. Okay, we are closing in on the last two slides. Thank you all for bearing with me, and I, I apologize. I will try to save some time for questions. Um, essentially, when it comes to your demeanor uh, while you're presenting, you want to avoid um, sort of seeming like you're standing on a soapbox. No, no matter how important the issue feels to you, um, generally speaking, you know, sarcasm or excessive rhetoric, things like that, um, they're, they're may, maybe they'll impress like a jury in a trial court, but they're rarely going to make a good impression on either a trial judge or appellate court justices. Um, so really just try to stick with sort of that, you know, neutral professional demeanor um, when presenting an oral argument. Um, likewise, you know, as, as much as we all like to try to make other people laugh, I recommend avoid trying to uh, avoiding attempts at humor. Um, you know, jokes can oftentimes be misunderstood, um, and it's sort of just a risky way to spend what very precious time you have with the court um, to address their concerns. So just, you know, avo avoid attempts at humor. I think that's a safe bet. <laughs> um, we've already talked about not reading a speech. Um, that can sort of cause people's eyes to, to gloss over. Um, maintain solid eye contact with the court that will help keep their attention. Um, and we've already talked about seeming organized by you know, not having a huge pile of disorganized papers, but instead having your papers with you in a way that you can effectively go through them quickly. Um, and lastly, you, do, you wanna be courteous, but it's okay to be firm as well. Um, because at the end of the day, you are an advocate for a client um, who's you know, depending on you to persuade the court that their position is legally correct. Um, so it's okay, you know, you, you do want to keep sort of that neutral professional demeanor, um, but you are allowed to be sort of more forceful in the conclusions and the points that you're trying to make um, when addressing a court. Um, and then lastly, just with respect to when your opponent is talking um, or, or when it's not your turn to talk at all, um, always, you know, try to keep quiet. You don't want to be a distraction in the courtroom generally. Um, when your opponent is speaking, you know, you, you don't want to have strong facial reactions to anything they say. Just try to keep that neutral sort of poker-like face. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, you definitely might want to take a few notes on things that they're saying in case you want to raise some points on rebuttal. Um, and then definitely try to remain flexible. I think I've mentioned flexibility sort of throughout this presentation, so I won't, um, I won't belabor the point. Um, but really, my last piece of advice is just be yourself. You know, whatever your style is as a human being, it, it's okay to incorporate that into your oral, oral advocacy style as well. Um, you know, if you're like a naturally friendly, bubbly person, it's okay to smile during your during your presentation because that's part of who you are. That's part of your personality. By the same token, if you're a naturally very serious person, um, don't try to force smiling and, and friendliness when it's not really in your personality to do so. Because at the end of the day, whoever's observing you is going to sense sincerity or insincerity in your manner of presentation. And so the more true you are to your own personality, I think the stronger your presentation will be at the end of the day. All right, so with that, I apologize. I've only left about a minute for questions, but I do definitely want to hear from the audience if there are any. So please let me know. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was really great. Uh, folks, any any questions? I know we only have like a minute or so left, but we can try to answer a question out there. And by the way, um, we this is our first time doing this topic. Uh, it was highly requested by a lot of our fellows and scholars by John Paul Stevens, fellows and, uh, and scholars. And so um, let us know how we did and let us know what you thought of today. Uh, Tiffany was great. Um, and, and also let us know what other topics you would like us to cover. I dropped in the, in the comments a link to a survey. Um, so you can go ahead and um, 
click on that. It takes like two minutes to fill it out. Um, and we'd love to know what your ideas are for future topics. Any uh, questions? Yeah. I, I, Carlos, I did see that someone asked if it'd be possible to get the slides. Um, I'm just going to just email them to you after this presentation, like I did last time. Um, and then if you could just share them however you shared them last time, that'd be great. Sounds good. Yeah, perfect. So, yes, yeah, so you will be getting uh, slides. All right. Well, with that, I just want to thank you, Tiffany. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you, and I hope that uh, we can work together again in the future to keep providing this kind of content um, to our scholars and fellows. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me to speak. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Take care. Okay, Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, participating in this webinar. We hope you found it helpful. Like I said, let us know what you thought of uh, the content. There's a link in uh, the comments to a survey. Um, and a uh, reminder that uh, in the description right below, there is a link to the third and final event in the series. It's gonna be on March 26th, and it's going to be on issue spotting. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, please sign up and you'll receive reminders um, once, uh, once the event is, is live on the 26th. So with that, thank you so much, and we'll see you in a few weeks.